All right. I'm here today with Camille. I am super excited to talk to you. You're someone who I've known about for a while, and I haven't been able to figure out how to get in touch with you. Um, and I was just wondering if you could just kind of tell us your story. You're a detransitioner. And I, other than that, I don't know a lot about you. Yeah. So I was, whew, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because my whole health journey pretty much started like after I, I got top surgery. So I got top surgery. Um, and then I developed all these health complications. And so really what happened was that I was in a very bad place and I decided that I either need to figure out like to get better or I need to end my life. Like I was at that point because I had done 20 years of talk therapy. Um, I had done EMDR, um, hypnotherapy, somatic experiencing, DBT. I was on my second round of um, TMS. Um, are you familiar with TMS at all? Is that the electric? It's similar. Okay. Like there, there's like two there. So there's ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy, which is horrible. Like I did a video on it and like, I, I try to stay non-partial, like for those videos, I try to stay as non-partial as possible, but like, it was so horrific. Like somebody had developed retrograde amnesia from ECT. So it's just, okay. it's such a radical treatment and it's just like there's just so many people who commit suicide after getting the treatment because of the right. side effects so but you're talking um, about the low level yes okay. so tms is a transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy oh. so um it's pretty much using magnets to stimulate the brain and it's out of all the treatments i'd done it was the most effective but it never got me to where i needed to be okay, so can we just go back because yeah. i'm trying to figure out why, how old were you when you started needing therapy? And do you have a sense of sort of what, what was the underlying cause? Yeah. So I started, like, I started really young. So like my parents divorced when I was five. And I think that's important is that I have a history of trauma. Um, so they divorced when I was five. And then I, let's see here. They diagnosed me with ADHD really young so usually they miss girls but like it was obviously ADHD so uh, they, they caught me when I was really young and uh, but the thing was they never gave me skills to deal with it and my mom just wanted to put me on medication and I think at the time there wasn't the understanding of like you can mitigate your ADHD to, to some extent um, so um, yeah so I, I struggled with childhood depression, ADHD, um, ended up developing generalized anxiety disorder. So um, yeah, I just like, I've, I've had a, a like a history of it. Um, it, it was was any of this related to a sense of sort of feeling like you were born in the wrong body or was it just, was that something that came on later once you sort of start hearing about um, transgender ideology? So I'm kind of an interesting case because I transitioned when I was 30. So I'm one of the older um, transitioner or like detransitioners. Um, and for me, gender ideology wasn't really a thing when I was growing up and when I was having the gender issues. So um, it started in sixth grade. Um, well, around that time. So I started dressing like in limited to like preteen girly fashion um, around like fifth and sixth grade. And it made my dad nervous. And he told me how men his age talked about girls my age and kind of like to scare me to like, like my dad, dad has most likely generalized anxiety disorder, most likely ADHD. He's never been diagnosed. Um, so he was trying to protect me, but he also had this fear that I was going to be promiscuous. Um, and then in sixth grade, um, my best friend was raped by her brother and it really, like my anxiety heightened after that point, I started to dress more masculine. I was also really into like anime around that time. And so like, I was really into this, the kind of like, I wanted to kind of emulate more of the, the mat of the boyish characters and stuff. And it was 
like and I remember because it, again this is kind of like before the trans thing happened but it's like my friend and I were both doing it like we were both we were both dressing more um more um masculine it sounds and, really protective I mean yeah and so and she also had um issues like I don't know she's never had like a great psyche valve done um so she probably it would probably benefit her but I imagine that like I, I just know her and she's obviously dealt with some mental health issues she didn't have um a great like there's issues in her family as well so yeah and then when did you get the the mastectomy so I got the mastectomy um August 27th 2020 and I yeah it was like weird because it's during the pandemic as well and they yeah, yeah and they, so, they were, so at some point did you get a diagnosis of gender dysphoria so I, I know I've seen somebody for um let's see here I've seen somebody for gender because I identified as non or I thought it was non-binary I, like I wasn't but I thought I was non-binary um when like when I let's see here I did that in 2016 I saw a therapist around that and she was gender affirming and then from there I let's see here so I, I did and then I did the surgery oh yeah then the letters right so the letters I believed if I remember right diagnosed me with, with the gender issue but I told them everything like I told them about my friend um, and they actually wrote that on the letter like they acknowledged that there was some trauma there but they still um still pass through but i think that i definitely got that diagnosis from the letters um but yeah i'd seen a therapist and I, the red flag should have been that um she was talking about other kin and i sh probably should have realized at that point that she was not a good therapist but yeah. it's so hard though when you're going to someone for help you yeah. sort of follow their lead that's why you're there right because you're not you're not making good choices you're not you know you don't have the the skills and and one of the things that that we talked about it a little bit before we started the recording I think is um how how people are encouraged to go to therapy and therapists typically don't teach skills and 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 that's what a lot of us needed was management skills how do we manage our ADHD our anxiety our eating disorders, our depression. And instead we tend to, therapists tend to, at least nowadays, very easily take people down the path. So people who don't, haven't heard the term other kin before, can you explain that? From my understanding, it's identifying as like animals and such. Mm -hmm. So like, or thinking you're an animal or like something like that. Like, like I never, that was kind of like, because I, I had CPTSD from being in women's study circles because I was a women's studies minor in college. And that actually was where I was introduced to, to um, gender ideology was, it was in college. Um, but yeah, from my understanding, like, because the other kin was never really discussed there. And I was, I feel like I was towards the end of that, if that makes sense. But I, I think it's something like identifying as animals yeah. or thinking you're an animal. Yeah. It's not, it's not a healthy um, mm -hmm. outlook for people to have. <laughs> right right sure sure thing yeah do you feel like you um had dissociative disorder at all I was definitely disconnected from my body like I feel like since I've worked on my mental or my physical health issues like I've become more more connected with my body I've actually been able to work through my trauma which is like weird it's it's this sort of like reverse way of of looking at it of if you improve your physical health then it will actually improve your mental health mm -hmm. um but this is something that you know that's oh and kind of going back to the skill part um you know I had done like things like dbt which is dialectical behavioral therapy and such and um and I do think that yes skills are helpful and I and skills have helped with my ADHD but at the same time it's just there's a lot and the, it's concerning to me about kind of the talk about mental health and detransitioners is that um there's this there's tends to be this focus on um therapy and like you know 
those types, sorts of services. And what concerns me is that like I had like elevated CRP levels um, and whole blood histamine, which I which I'm guessing I probably had these issues before my surgery, but everybody overlooked that most likely because I had the mental health diagnoses. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, I have very similar history to you. I was put on um, Ritalin. I was one of the first girls to be put on Ritalin um, because my ADHD was so bad. Um, <laughs> and they do, they tend to medicate and do therapy. And one of the things that recently I, I did a radical diet change because I had all sorts of health problems. <laughs> and suddenly a lot, uh, not just my health problems have gotten better, but my mental health has gotten so much better. So do you want to talk a little bit about the, the physical stuff that you had dealing, that you were dealing with? Yeah. So I think that talking about the physical stuff, I think it's important to kind of go back to, um, when I was in high school, I, I became like, and I think that that's, this is another thing that's kind of like missing from this discussion is, um, I was into like, what was it? Like we were doing fast food nation and there was like a book and I can't remember the book, but they were talking about like how animals were treated and, you know, um, kind of in like, you know, conventional farming. I can't remember the exact term, but you know, the, the kind of like really ugly, like they're treating the animals poorly and stuff. And I remember like the pigs were eating newspaper or something like, it was like horrible. And I remember reading this book and I'm like, I'm just going to eat fish. So I became pescatarian and I ma only made the connection recently that I fell into depression about a year after I, st I made the switch. Mm -hmm. So diet and like, and I was struggling with depression before, but it, it definitely worsened. Um, and that's the thing is that um, diet is so important for um, diet. Just I've just heard so many stories about people who are carnivore um, and their um, issues go away. And it's it's a complicated issue because it's like, well, is it that they need to be on carnivore or is it that they're like environmental issues, like how we process our foods? Um I've heard that we don't process our like wheat the way we should. And so that we're having issues because of that. Um, and then there's like people who go to Europe and they lose all this weight or they don't gain any weight and they eat terribly. And I was somewhat similar because I, I went to Japan and like, even though like I still was having the mental health issues, like I lost weight in Japan. And I mean, yes, I was, I was more active in Japan, but that's the, the thing I've noticed here too, is that like, if I change my diet, I'll lose a bunch of weight. And so there's something, there's something about our diet and about the environment that I think is, is being overlooked. And, um, and it's so easy just to throw pills and therapy at a, at a problem. It's so much easier than to sort of do the hard work of trying to parse out what else might be going on. So right. when you went in for the, did you wanted the double mastectomy I'm guessing yes did you feel that it was going to solve your problems to to be more masculine presenting um well and that's kind of an interesting thing too because I let's see here I thought or like I was non I I thought I was non-binary at the time and so I actually got the female to non-binary surgery so it wasn't like I was I was not wanting to be a man is wanting to be something old, like neutral. Together, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting that whole concept of neuter. Every time I see a woman who says she's non-binary, I'm like, "You're gender non-conforming. It's okay. Sure. Like you're not adhering to regressive sex-based stereotypes. Let's celebrate that instead of rejecting your womanhood." Um, but I believe I would have been totally on the non-binary wagon if I if I were younger today because it is that rejection of those really regressive stereotypes of femininity. Yeah, I think the the trauma probably played the biggest role for me too because it was like like I I didn't that yeah that and and the trauma because it was just sort of like and I remember I actually had because I, I listen to people and they say that they had discomfort around like, you know, their breast or something like that. And it, it's just like, it's such a strange thing to me because it's like, well, you're, these trans people are describing the same thing I am, like that they had a real discomfort around, um, 
around things like their breasts. So, yeah. So when, at what point after the, the double mastectomy, did you realize that maybe that wasn't, wasn't what was going on for you, that, that maybe that wasn't, hadn't been the right treatment? Yeah. And for me, it was a little messy because right after the surgery, I developed complications. So it was like within days, um, like I had trouble swallowing and then that eventually resolved itself. I ended up developing rain odds. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not sure uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's when your capillaries shrink and there's like, yeah, yeah. Painful, like to get things out of the freezer and stuff. But, um, I developed all these health complications, like tinnitus. Um, it was so bad. Like I couldn't sleep And in, in general after the surgery. Like I wasn't sleeping. Like there would be nights where I literally went sleep through the night. And so it was, it was, it was very difficult. And like what happened was that, oh, and then I had like a, because I was going to ER multiple times during this time and like they gave me a Valium and then they like sent me home. And I remember I woke up that night and my neck was burning and there's like sweat pooled under my eyes and And then I had like burning for like months later, like, and I don't know what particularly solved it. It might've been the Ambien. And then they put me on Ambien for too long because the doctors weren't talking to each other. And I was just seeing a lot of doctors because I knew something was up, but nobody was giving me the help I needed. And so I've seen all these doctors and I know like after they thought I had psychosomatic fever, like they stopped taking me seriously. Like there was like this sort of like switch in their attitude because there's like, they were like, okay, well, it's in your head. You need to see a psychologist. So they kept referring me to psychologists. I'm like, I've done therapy for 20 years. Like I, I know, like I've done DBT. I've done, you know, all these, like the cutting edge stuff. I had done everything. So I knew that wasn't it. And that wasn't the I've answer. I've never heard of doctors suggest that a fever was psychosomatic. Yeah. Or yeah, there's something like, and I guess it's a thing where, where, um, there's but the a thing term is, for it, and I can't remember um, for for actual yeah. physical ailments um, that occur because of emotional distress. Yeah, and so it's like conversion disorder, maybe. I'm not sure. There's a couple different things. I remember looking it up, and I I know with psychos, I think, and I believe the term is psychosomatic fever. But the thing is, like, you have to actually be running a fever, and they never tested me for it because I know because I took I took my temperature and I didn't have it, mm. so. Yeah. And I'm imagining that I probably had issues with inflammation because, um, both of my labs that have tested positive, um, are like, were higher on the spectrum or not spectrum, but like the labs that were higher, um, were like C-reactive protein and then whole blood histamine. Um, so I had these labs that were showing inflammation. And I, another thing I think was interesting was that I was taking methylphenidate CD and yeah, I've done that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I was taking methylphenidate CD and that's the only medication I responded well to. Like out of all the medications, mm. that was the one that was actually helping me, but I couldn't take it because it would dry my mouth out too much. So I ended up getting gum disease. I was able to resolve that, <laughs> but, yeah. but it's like, I, I just, I can't take medications and, um, you know, um, but what I think is interesting is that there's that methyl in there um, for methylphenidate CD. And I don't know if that has anything to do with being under methylated, which when you have, when you're um, have high whole blood histamine, you're under methylated. So I don't know if the methyl and both of those have any sort of connection and that's why it's responding to that. And I don't know if doctors could have possibly picked up on that. Um, but yeah, that just nobody was looking into that. And I, I just was, I was trying so hard because I knew that there was something out there, like something wasn't right. And I was doing everything that conventional medicine had to offer, but they didn't offer me what I needed, which was that I needed to change my diet. Um, I responded very well to body work. And then I also responded um, oh, to earthing and then to hybrid auction therapy. So those were the treatments that really uh, stabilized me. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. and I think that this is, this is part of what sort of the bigger picture of the whole gender 
ideology um, is that it's it's embracing this idea that we just throw drugs to fix things, as we talked about before. And one of the things that really, um, I was put on steroids for a little bit um, a while ago for my inflammation and from you know my autoimmune issues. And I felt so good. <laughs> I felt so good. <laughs> I felt better than I had probably for most of my life. And then the doctor said, well, you can't stay on them because they're not good for you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and that made me start thinking a lot about testosterone and, and how I bet so many um, girls and, and young women and, and even older women, if they start taking testosterone, initially they're going to feel really good. And, right. but the long-term consequences are devastating and our doctors need to stop looking at that short term and start figuring out the underlying issues rather than just throwing something at us that will make us feel better. Right. Yeah. And I bet that that would, and then there's also like, you feel good because, and I think, I think too, like health has to do with also like, like social aspects. And then if like, I was never a part of the trans community um, or like really the non-binary partially because I, I had the CPTSD from, from call out culture. And some of those call outs were from, um, from trans people or from non-binary people. So I just, I kind of like was very isolated, but like, if you are part of those communities and you're like getting like that sort of like love and stuff like that, like that's, um, that's also an aspect of mental health as well, that, that, um, you know, they're, they're getting the, that sort of like encouragement and benefit and that feels good. But, but because the underlying problem, like the health, physical health problem wasn't never addressed, like that's still going to continue. So. Right. Right. So at what point after the mastectomy, did you start to think, huh, maybe I'm not non-binary. Maybe there's other stuff going on. Right. So, so I was like, I was actually about a, probably a little bit over a year and a half after, after the surgery, because I've been so fixated on physical health issues. And you didn't take testosterone, did you? No, I just, I just had the double mastectomy with nickel graft. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was probably about a year and a little bit over a year and a half when like, I was like, okay, I, well, I mean, even before that, like, I thought I was like having some issues with gender. And so I remember I saw an NAET practitioner and I can't remember it's something like Nutripad allergy elimination technique, something along those lines. And so I've seen that practitioner for, for like allergies. And it's kind of like a, I want to say, it's a, there's like muscle testing involved. I can't remember the, the, the term that's used. And then also there's acupuncture, but I, I did this treatment and I said, okay, can you do gender? Like, I just want to do gender. Like I, I know I have like, I always knew, like, the thing that happened with my friend was a big issue. Like, I want to work on that. I want to work on gender. So I might have had, like, a little bit of an inkling around that time. And then it wasn't until this year, like, that I realized that um, I'm, I've been a woman this whole time and that this has been a mistake. So, yeah. so how, did, how was that sort of realization? I think that thankfully I had like stabilized myself emotionally enough that I can handle it um but I mean it's like sometimes I, I get sad about it. like I don't fit dresses the same way again which um, makes me sad like I can't breastfeed um I also like this year was like oh I want a family like this is something I've never wanted like I was so um biologically dysfunctional that um like that was something I, I just never wanted until recently so and I don't think that's unusual I I know a, a number of young women who, um you know late 20s early 30s who never thought they wanted kids and suddenly they yeah. realize they actually do so what what would you say to the doctors that that sort of you know open the door for you to have this surgery um that they need to look at other underlying health issues that it's just they should have like I wish that they had looked for inflammation and autoimmune things like I I still don't know everything that's going on like I have musculoskeletal issues still 
um, I like I got most likely calcium deposits after the surgery, like my knuckle is bigger than the other knuckles. And that happened after the surgery. And it, like, it was happening while I was awake. It was happening very rapidly. Um, but yeah, I just, that and when people do these surgeries, and that's kind of the issue is that they're doing these surgeries like these doctors because they think that, well, if you don't do the surgery, then they're going to kill themselves. And the thing is, is that when you're like me and you have like this heightened state of anxiety and depression and all these mental health issues, you're putting this huge stressor on, on your body, um, to, to do the surgery. And like it, that's when I was talking to my naturopath, she said, you most likely had an upregulated nervous system after, after the surgery, because it is, it is trauma. Like you're, you're doing this radical surgery, um, and removing a body part. And it just, it's so important to like get that under the control. And the thing is that if the thing is, is that some of these people who think like myself, who think that they're non-binary when they're not, they're wanting to do these surgeries, they might not, not want, or might not need to do these surgeries. And in general, I, I'd prefer nobody to do, to do these surgeries, like, because of the fact that you don't know what health complications, it's extremely experimental. And it's just, yeah, it's just the, yeah, I just, I, I just don't want anybody to go through this. And so that's really why I've come forward is just, it's, it's horrible. So. Well, and the double mastectomy is not a minor surgery. Um, it's, it's radical. I mean, it's, it's like you said, removing a body part, a lot of tissue, and it is trauma on the body. So you're taking kids, um, people who are already vulnerable and inflicting a trauma on them, um, yeah. and telling them that that's the only way they can survive themselves, which is a really disturbing message. I wonder what, what would you tell a, you know, a girl maybe, you know, who's 13 or 14, who's getting this message, what would you tell her to, to try to explain to her that maybe the surgery isn't the right approach? I guess that like I had these other health issues and that I would recommend looking into the, to like things like inflammation, autoimmunity before before looking into something like that and that it might make things worse definitely but um, yeah that it might that something like that this radical might actually exacerbate the underlying issues right. and especially if it's a health issue mm -hmm. what's amazing to me is you said you had it done during covid and my understanding was they only did emergency surgeries right. during covid so somehow your doctors were convinced that removing your breasts was a life-saving intervention. Yeah, they, they considered it a medical. Or at least they said that. At <laughs> least they said they believed that, <laughs> whether they did or not. Yeah, yeah, they, they um, it was considered a medical necessity and it was covered by Medicaid, so. Wow, wow. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what state, what state are you in? Oregon. Okay. I know Oregon has been very liberal in allowing, especially children, to access mastectomies sometimes without even parental consent. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. I, like, I hadn't heard about Oregon in particular, but it doesn't surprise me because I do know, like, it's it's very, it's it gets pretty far left over here. So, so how yeah. would you respond to someone because? Um, in my experience with trans rights activists, one of the things they say to me, well, they say a couple of things. They either say, I was never really trans, um, which is true. I never was. I had gender dysphoria, yeah. which is even that is like a strange diagnosis. I had mental health issues. I had dissociative right. disorder. Um, the other thing they said is that I've internalized uh, my transphobia. And, or, and, and if I would really let myself be the true person, the authentic me, that I would be transgender. Um, what I'm imagining them saying to you is, well, you had your breasts removed and now you're doing better. So clearly that was the best treatment. How would you respond to that? Oh gosh, that makes sense that they would say something yeah, like that. I, 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 I do. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I know that that wasn't the case because I developed all these health complications after the so surgery. Things got worse. Things got worse. And mentally, things also got worse. Like, I was the worst. Like, my mom talked to me about um, psychiatric hospitalization, like, after afterwards, because I was so dysfunctional. I remember she actually had to, like, lay down with me um, to go to sleep. Um, and, like, I was, remember, I, I wanted to go to ER shouting, like, you know, like, why are you letting me die? Why are you letting me die? And so it's just, yeah, the, it's just, they're so disconnected. And it's kind of like, I, I look at a lot of these activists and I'm imagining too that they probably have you know issues with inflammation they probably they might have autoimmune issues and so they're they're being and I think that I, I know I'm getting a little bit off topic but I'll, I'll, I'll come back um, but it reminds me of something what one of my therapists said was that um, Camille you're digging the hole but you're digging it wider instead of getting yourself out so it, it's just there's being sold this idea of like, you're upset, you're frustrated because of transphobia or sexism or racism. Like they're being sold that idea when it's like, well, what is there an underlying issue that's that's not being resolved? And I think that in general, I think the world would be a better place if we focused on like more of the, because I was not a healthy person to be around um, when I was struggling with inflammation and with, um, or with, with my health issues, it wasn't until like, I was like, I was confident. And then it's just like, things bounce off you too. Like, that's the thing is like, I know it's like these people, like they hold on to things and it's just like, when I'm feeling better physically, I, I know it's like, somebody will say something to me, like they'll insult me. I'm like, you know, it's just like, it bounces off of you because you're able to like, like take that information and like handle it better um but like for for those people who would say that let's see here i i think that it's difficult because you're i i like it's such a complicated issue because it's like well you think that i got better because i had the, the top surgery but it's like i i want i want to breastfeed i want to like fit a dress the same way i want to you know get married like you know there's so many things that this surgery has limited me from um and like and I'm not I don't want like I, I want to go back and actually get the surgery but or like reverse the surgery um which is just like you can't do um but it's just like and I know because of like and it's like who's gonna believe you but it's it's like, I know what it's like to really struggle. And I know what like my body felt like and that I know lived experiences like kind of convenient to when, um, you know, it's, it's just sort of like a lived experience. They like to cherry pick that a little bit, but it's just like, I know what it's like to be like, it feels like my body was running on a higher voltage than it should have been. And I, I just, I know what that feels like and I know what it feels like to be better because like, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling on a little bit. Well, in a way, it's such a convenient thing to say because um, anybody who does any kind of um, transition, they can, and, and, and eventually, even if it's 20 years later, starts to do yeah. better, they can say, well, see, it helped. Um, and in, in just in my view, I don't think um, cosmetic surgery, something that's exclusively cosmetic, should ever be used as a treatment. I think if somebody, you know, there are cases where people want to get cosmetic surgery just because they think it'd be kind of nice. That's right. a lot different than this is life-saving. Um, and one of the things Patrick Lappert, who's a um, reconstructive surgeon said, is that when they're in school, they're taught that if somebody comes in and thinks that a, you know, a nose job or, you know, a facelift or something will make their life, you know, exponentially better. And that that's the cause of all their problems that they're not to do the surgery, that they need to refer that person for therapy because it's, it's a mental health issue. Um, and, and it confounds me how it is that, that if somebody went in and thought that, you know, having a facelift would, would, you know, make all their problems go away. Um, how the same doctor could cut somebody's breasts off or cut their testicles off or their penis off. Um, or put a fake phallus on them, um, how how that's ethical. 
and how that how doctors could could re could accept that message and and anytime they do that surgery they're promulgating that message they're affirming that message that a cosmetic surgery is an appropriate treatment mm -hmm. yeah and i had no idea that 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 was actually a thing because that goes completely against like what happened with me like because that's exactly the why I was getting the surgery was like, I was thinking like, oh, I'm going to feel so much better. Like I have this discomfort, like it, it felt so horrible, like the discomfort around my chest too, or like my breast. It's like, um, it, it was, there was, it, it was just uncomfortable. Like, and it was, I, I wanted them gone and it was because of trauma. Like it was because of like what had happened to me. So, well, it reminds me a lot of my friend, Billy, who um, was sexually assaulted and, and um, you know, somebody had fondled his, his penis and he directed all of his anger towards his penis and he wanted it gone. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a really normal trauma response to sexual assault or abuse. And the fact that doctors are not recognizing that means that, in a way they're letting they're letting perpetrators get away with with this um, because they're willing to it's almost like a, a victim blaming um, i feel like in a really weird sense and i hate to use terms like that um sort of willy-nilly but it does seem like if if you're willing to say to a to a survivor of sexual abuse or assault that the appropriate response to that is to become a different person and to have parts of your body removed and to take cross-sex hormones then you are essentially saying that 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 per that, you know that they are somebody else and that they they should run away from who that trauma happened to, and that just that seems like just a horrible message. And it also allows perpetrators potentially to get away with it because instead of having therapists or police or social workers or parents try to figure out uh, was there sexual assault, is there somebody out there that hurt my child. They're instead pushing that child to transition. Yeah, it's it's a concerning. It's concerning that they're not looking more into it. Like definitely, because it, it's like the whole. Because that's the thing of, that I've seen with so many detransitioners is that there is this this common thread of sexual violence, like in their stories. And I think that too, it just I don't know, just like I don't trust doctors anymore, like conventional doctors, like. <laughs> it's just it's like really hard to when when a doctor tells you that it's a life-saving treatment for you to have a body part a functional body part removed yeah and but it's just like it was also like the whole like I've seen so many doctors and I remember I had like like in this all probably started to around um let's see here like this this probably started also around um my my brain just is not working today. Um, but, um, it, it started around, um, you know, this, this whole, the, the whole like divorce stuff, the whole, um, like my dad, like my mom was not healthy growing up and she, um, emotionally, she was not, um, supportive in a way that she should have been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was upset at the divorce, but she didn't handle it well. And so she was spiteful. And so there was like issues, like, because I was more, my dad was the more stable parent. And I knew like growing up that he was healthy sort of thing or healthier. And so I gravitated towards him and he would tell me um, how manipulative my mom was. So there was this message around um, being a girl and being manipulative and you know things like that and then it's just also like um I had like really bad period as well so like I would have really bad cramps and like I remember going to the doctor and they said like they wouldn't the insurance wouldn't cover labs for it and mm -hmm. and so they never really looked into like I had like a better psychologist or like not psychologist but gynecologist um when I went when I was like an adult, but, um, yeah, it, and it's just like, the thing about the period is now, like, I, so I have heavy flow, I was having bad cramps back then, like, starting, like, when I was starting to get my period, now, it's just like, I get a regular flow, and I don't get any cramps, and wow. so, like, 
that's something that like through these treatments I've done and through my diet and through um, lifestyle changes, it's like, I've been able to, to do that. And I think that's the thing too, is just like with girls, it's like, it's not normal to get cramps and stuff like that, but we're telling them it's like, it's normal for you to get cramps and like, you hate that time of the month and stuff. And I mean, yeah, there, you definitely have changes during that time of the month and, you know, and you have a cycle and like your body will react to that in certain, you know, your, your body's doing certain things during certain parts of that cycle, but we've, we've normalized that as well. And so it's like, well, being a girl and being a woman, isn't a good thing. Um, well, and isn't it insane that they wouldn't cover the cost of blood work for you, but they would cover the cost of this invasive surgery? I mean, that's one of the things that I look at is the inequity in how women's services are treated versus transgender services. Um, again, it seems like it's not okay to be a woman, but if you want to be a man, we'll cover stuff for you. Um, and if you're a man who pretends to be a woman, we'll cover stuff for you. But if you're a woman, we won't cover stuff for you. <laughs> Yeah, that was, and I mean, to, to the credit of that, I mean, that was like, a, I was on a different insurance and that was like back in like probably the early 2000s, but still like, I, I agree. Like I, like I, from what I've heard, like detransitioners have had issues with reconstruction surgery from my understanding, like is, is that, yeah. And so yeah, it's, it's yeah, just generally like, insurance won't cover any kind of um, detransition. Yeah. And I mean, and two, the thing is that, and I don't know if there is a good test for this, but there's been speculation that I might have a mold toxicity issue, but like my insurance won't cover the labs for it. And so it's possible that the Heiberg auction therapy helped with the mold toxicity, but we don't know because, and like I said, I don't know if there's a great lab for that, but it's, it's again, is that there's all these health issues that are being overlooked. And then it's just, you have this, I don't know, like I'm, I'm that type of person that can see like all the different things and how they all connect. And so it's like kind of difficult. Like I, and I know like during this, I'm probably like going all over the place, but um, it reminds me of like, I think part of the issue is that like I was in therapy and I was told that I must be non-binary because um, gay people were told that it was a mental illness when it wasn't. So <laughs> there's so and many. Therefore, you're obviously non-binary. Yeah. So that, that was like, yeah. that was the, the yeah, it, it's just, there's so many factors in play here. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's really complicated. And, right. and that's where I think it's hard to explain to people what's going on because, you know, the average person on the street who does, who's yeah. not familiar with stuff, they're just like, yeah, yeah, gay people, they're fine. Like, why would you want to go, you know, why would you be homophobic is sort of where they're coming from. And they don't understand all the ins and outs of what's going on. Right. So you, you are speaking out a little bit about this. What would you sort of, what would your... Um, if you had had the opportunity to, you know, get on a news station or to testify somewhere, what would be the message that you would tell people? Um, it would definitely, I, I really want to like kind of hone in on the, um, on the underlying health issues, because I feel like too, that's not, I'm not hearing that as much discussed when it comes to detransitioners is that, you know, maybe there was, um, you know, again, the inflammation, autoimmunity, like I was, um, you know, and the thing is too, is like, was it when you're under methylated, like I am, like you, you have a low tolerance for pain. So it's just like, there's, there's just so much that's being looked on, looked overlooked on the health side of things. And you're doing the surgery, um, that again, you wouldn't necessarily need to do the surgery if you had your mental health under control. So really like, I, I want to fixate on like getting people's mental, um, mental health through their physical health under control. Um, and, you know, to prevent that, but yeah, that's just something I, I'm really hoping that gets out there a little bit more because that's, I mean, that, that's the reason why I, like, I was so miserable and I thought this was going to improve my life. And then it's just, um now I'm dealing with all these health complications that I don't know 
like I don't know if I'm going to get past these like I'm going to try everything I can but it's just like I don't know all the health issues it's just um doctors tend to be even like my naturopath is sort of, they're like well if it's not really bothering you then you know and I'm just like well I have these bumps on like I have this growth or whatever on my knuckle and I have like a growth on my ankle and it's like well if it's not really bothering you then it's just sort of like you know and I'm like okay is there something actually going on I want to know so I can address it is it an indication of an underlying issue right and so and I think that the best advice I can give to people is just work on your overall health because of the fact that you're going to get that response of, um, you know, you, yeah, you're going to get that response of, well, if it's not really bothering you or, you know, don't go chasing symptoms or, you know, when you get those responses, the, the just the, the only thing you can really do is like work on diet, you know, the th things that I'm hearing around are like, um, cutting out seed oils, um, you know, go maybe more cardboard eating, uh, leaning, um, eat meat, uh, cut out processed food, sugars, um, you know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Most people, it it's difficult to get access to, um, not every, well, I mean, with all these things that I'm going to say, like, not everybody can do it, but there's hyperbaric oxygen therapy earthing you can get an earthing pad um you know what what's the other thing that that really helped um hyperbaric oxygen diet exercise oh what's that exercise exercise, I mean, exercise works yeah yeah sleep is huge <laughs> yeah. but you know and the interesting thing about sleep was that um every because they gave me a, a sleep journal and they're like okay we'll just use the sleep journal and help you sleep and I'm like this is not doing anything for me like <laughs> and so then I did hyperbaric oxygen therapy I'm like oh that's what it's supposed to feel like so oh, there's wow. something about, about the hyperbaric oxygen therapy which are you familiar with hyperbaric a little bit just yeah, a little so bit much, so it it's sort of yeah. pressure yeah you're receiving uh, pure oxygen in a pressurized environment mm -hmm. There, there's different like forms of it. I've done the soft chamber, um, but it was amazing. Like my, um, I like I started to think more clearly and I was more articulate when I, after I did the treatment or after I started the treatment. And then, yeah, my insomnia got so much better. Like my insomnia, I was just able to sleep through the night and I like, I was getting full sleep. And so there's something there that's not, that's not allowing me to get the full sleep when I'm not doing that treatment. Like I'm, I, I know like when I stopped doing the treatment, I was like, okay, it's, the insomnia is kind of coming back now. So I don't quite know what's all going on, but it's, it's still like, and you know, it's a work in progress. So. Well, and what you're saying is so interesting because another thing that I hear all the time is that um a lot of the detransitioners are on the autism spectrum. And so people are chalking it up to autism. And I'm like, maybe the autism is a symptom too. Um, <laughs> right. In the same way, the ADHD and the anxiety. And I mean, all these are so connected to our physical health. And like you right. said, we live in a world where it's really hard to get just good food. Um, our society is not, is not, um, set up really in a way for us to access good food. And just my experience with my, you know, radical diet change. Um, I mean, I was to the point where I couldn't walk around the block because I hurt so much. And now yeah. I walk about six miles a day. Um, I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's a huge difference that's, just by changing diet. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's actually just with changing diet, because like I've I, I, I kind of threw the kitchen sink at it because I'm like, I, I just need to figure out like how to get this under control. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, oh, and body work was the other one I, I, oh, I forgot. Okay. About. Oh yeah. And that's something really briefly to get into is that when you have a good thing for people who've gotten surgeries is that when you had something like scars from your surgery, um, what a body work practitioner told me was that your scars can cling on to the healthy tissue. And so when you, there are, there's forms of body work that can kind of like soften the scars and stuff. Oh, and so that's something to consider. Like I've seen some pictures of like before and after, and they do look 
they do look like there's a significant improvement there. So, so that might be something for, for others who have had surgeries to look into because right. some of the scarring is, is brutal. I it mean, is. It's, it's debilitating. I've heard of people who are, you know, they lose function because yeah. the scarring so bad. Yeah. And I, um, I had, um, Claire Darling who I, let's see here. She was, um, I have like an HBOT series, like where she actually did hybrid auction therapy and she has like a traumatic brain injury and she got another one. Um, and so I documented that, but she also, I also recorded her doing a video because she's a body work practitioner who does scar work. And she talked about how there's this woman who had, um, like a hysterectomy and she had like this huge scar on her abdominum. And she said, um, the, the, the woman st struggled with incontinence. And so she said, you know, let me do work on your scar or something. Um, and then she did that and the woman's incontinence went away. Wow. So it was related to the scar for whatever reason. And that's something that most people aren't going to look into. Um, and I think too, it's just, I, I've just heard so many um, positive anecdotal evidence through like holistic treatments, but there's not the financial backing to do that. Like it's not big pharma, like they don't have big pharma's money. And so it's, it's, it's difficult. And the thing is too, is that it can be difficult to do. And I forgot what the study is, but it's like, where it's like, I guess a, you're having two studies and, you know, you're giving treatment to one, but you're not to other. Right. And so it can be difficult because when you're doing body work, you know, you're not, you're still doing things on the body that to make them think that it's, it's not. And so it can be difficult to like do those types of studies. Um, so I think that it's just, yeah, it, it's just, it's difficult because there's, I, I bet that somebody can figure it out, but it's. Yeah. Just, and everybody's every body is different and will respond differently. But another thing that you, that for some reason, when you were talking about the scarring and the body work is that it occurred to me that in a way, a mastectomy, a phalloplasty, um, orchiectomy, penectomy is sexual assault. Um, and I know one of the things that body work helps with is sexual assault, because a lot of times we store that trauma in our bodies. And I'm thinking that somebody who had that kind of a profound sexual assault where they had, you know, if somebody came up and grabbed your breasts, that's, that's an assault. If somebody mm -hmm. comes up and chops them off. That's, that's profound. Um, so, so it seems like, um, especially detransitioners might really benefit from, from not just the scar work, but also just processing that, that horrible trauma of having, you know, a sexual organ attacked like right. that. Right. Well, it's so weird, like with the, the sexual organs being like what you're talking about, because it reminds me of, um, like, I just found out that they were doing breast ironing in like Africa, I think it is. And it's like, it's such a horrific surgery. And yet we're, we're idealizing it mm -hmm. here in the U S so, um, in other, you know, Western countries. So it's, it's, it's just such a bizarre thing because you're, I, yeah, I just, it, it's like the whole, it, it's just like, I, I just don't want anybody to remove their body parts. Like, it's just, it's, it's like, I, I have a lot of sympathy for people who are trans. Um, but at the same time, I'm just like, it's such a traumatic, mm -hmm horrible experience and it's just like it's uncomfortable um you know I I still have pulling on some of the scars I need to get more scar work done yeah. so it's it's um it's just like I don't wish that on anybody like yeah. it's so horrible and it, for, it's for just trauma like, to be the solution like basically you're saying your treatment option is trauma <laughs> I mean yeah. that's that just is I mean if you when you really think about it that just mm -hmm. that should not I mean we we just don't do that I mean, that's just not in, I can't think of any other situation where we, where we would, you know, take something healthy and make it unhealthy as a treatment option. Right. Well, yeah, is there anything else that you wanted to, to discuss today? I've sort of been going off all over the place. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I have been too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, 
<laughs> I mean, just mainly kind of like bringing, bringing home the point of like, I, I really want the physical health issues to be looked more into. Like I was just watching, um, Dadis, um, let me see if I can say his name, Karazan, Karazian. Um, he was talking about, um, like it was a video I've watched. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of like all over the place, but pretty much he's talked about, um, that they're thinking depression is related to inflammation in the brain and how you can, how like the thing is like people who respond well to antidepressants, um, there it's actually reducing the inflammation, but he's also talking about how, um, what's it like, I guess cortisol can actually like shrink the brain or something like it's, it's just like, it's so crucial that we look more into like the physical health issues and start looking more at like things like fun functional medicine um, and naturopathy and stuff for possibly treating these because it's just like, I don't see this coming out of conventional medicine anytime in the future. So yeah, that's, that's the big thing. Just um, looking at like physical health issues and underlying health issues and kind of addressing that um, at least before even considering anything like these surgeries. Um, Especially yeah. because you mentioned the cortisol and we know that trauma causes overproduction of cortisol. Mm -hmm. So they're yeah. all intertwined how, you know, how emotional, how, you know, our, our emotional environment, the past traumas that we have can influence our physical health which then influences our emotional health and they're so intertwined. And we live in a world where you go to one specialist for one thing and another specialist for another right. thing, you're so disconnected. And so, I, I mean, I think in some ways we do have to have a whole new um, paradigm for, for treatment. Yeah, I think, I think that there's gonna have to be an overhaul. And I'm hoping that, that um, yeah, I'm hoping that that happens sooner than later because we're we're seeing a rise in autoimmune issues and such, and a rise also just in general mental health issues. So, um, yeah, we there needs to be a, a quick overhaul on that. I I think that there's a lot of like good people out there. You know, I just recommend. Um, I know Michaela Pearson went on Carnivore and she um, mm. her mental health issues went away. Um, so just recommend like kind of looking into for people who like need more help like looking into like physical health issues there are labs you can run um if they need to run labs just look at labs that are more around autoimmunity and then inflammation if they are having issues it's just like i i recommend people find a way to become their own advocate just because um the reality is that um you know conventional medicine isn't isn't there for us it's so not yeah it's not working yeah. and in some it's ways not. we maybe don't even need the conventional medical testing um if if there's something wrong you know it and we are creative people and we can experiment with our environments with our diet with our exercise with you know all different factors um I think much more effectively. And I think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I was programmed. You go to a doctor, you go to a doctor, you go to a doctor. Right. Um, <laughs> and so it's yeah. been sort of a, a shift for me to be like, oh, I don't have to go to a doctor. I can actually figure this out on my own. I don't need a doctor. And, you know, if I broke an arm, I'd go to a doctor. But, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty much thinking that staying away from doctors is going to keep me healthier. Right. Yeah. No, because all <laughs> you do is like, I mean, seriously, I went, I went, um, because I, I'm, uh, here's the thing, like, I probably have PMDD, and I asked my doctor about it, and she's like, well, mm, mm, well, you have thyroid, a little bit of a thyroid issue, so I don't want to give you that diagnosis, and I'm like, so, it, it, it was just sort of like, she was so hesitant on giving me any sort of diagnosis, and it was just like, well, how do I know what to, to, to actually deal with if I don't do it, and even though it's like, and she's also hesitant on giving me this diagnosis, even though, um, it sounds like I, I have it because like I get, I'll have struggle with suicidal ideation. And then it's just like, I get my period and I feel yeah. better. So there's something like, okay, well, I, it seems like I actually have this, but you don't want to actually like tell me what this is so I can figure out how to deal with it. But it's, it's, it's like, yeah, you can, you might have underlying health issues and 
you can possibly just get rid of them through through doing like a holistic approach like there's like fasting like circadian code is another thing um th there's just all these things that can be done it's just like you might not even ever know that you had a health condition because you were able to to get through it through um alternative means but i think it's too bad too that because really it, it's kind of like um you can fix your own car but mm -hmm. you but it's if you don't know how to fix your, your car, then it's just like you can go to a mechanic. And what's sad about the whole doctor issue is that um, it's nice having somebody who's an expert in the field, but it's the what treatments they're utilizing, which is medic mainly medication, because oh yeah, and that was the thing I was gonna say. Like I went to my gynecologist, and I'm like, okay, I'm having these problems. Like, what can I do for it? And she's like, Well, you can go on the pill. And I'm like, uh, well what can I do naturally and she's like oh <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. she, she doesn't know what to say because it's like that's all they can do is that they can give you a pill mm -hmm. and they can't be like well you can do like these other treatments because that's not what their models like made for it's not made to look at even like oh another thing is like and people do have to be careful about it but Wim Hof um what was it there there's like certain people don't really benefit as much from the Wim Hof method which um is like cold therapy um but like it's it's like they don't even know what to do because it is you know they're they're just trained to to give out medications but yeah just like I just recommend people start looking into it like I like I post things on my Twitter um I've talked a little bit on my YouTube channel about um things like diet in particular um but I haven't really done a whole lot of like recent videos, like on things like Wim Hof, which is something that I should, would be a helpful video, I think, to, to kind of talk about his method as well. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's things just kind of like look out for, for Twitter people who are carnivores. And like, once you find one of those people, usually they're connected with the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So once you find somebody who's interested in like carnivore, you sh they might be talking about Wim Hof, or they might be talking about, you know, TRE or, you know, there, once you find one of those people, just like it helps connect you to like that whole world of health out right. there. So, so for people yeah. who are interested, what's your YouTube channel? So my, uh, my YouTube channel is the get better researcher and my Twitter is, um, I believe it's get better tweets. Okay. I'll put it in the um, description below for anybody who wants to look into it more, because I think um, you're right. It is hard. If you're always used to going to a doctor, it's hard to get out of that mindset. But if you have some alternatives, if you have, you know, people saying, well, you can try this and try this and try this, um, that really helps. And to, and to hear other people's experience. So I'm, I'm excited that you're doing that kind of YouTube channel. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and thank you so much for sharing your insights and your story with us. I know um, it's got to be hard talking about all these complicated issues, but I think it will help people. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And I hope that this kind of gives people more insight into to what they can do to, to help their health. So yeah, yeah well, thank and you. prevent this from happening to others. So exactly. yeah, thank you for having me on.